um, because there wasn't much. Now it works. Yeah, it so works. Carl, you can check, but it should work now. Thank you. Um, we always need someone who's debugging our stream, right? So at least that means some person needs to show up in class so you can tell us in real time. <laughs> Minimum requirement, yeah? And one person in class actually tell us the stream does or does not work. Um, cool, thanks for that. Um, coming back, yes. So another project idea that I'm tasked to introduce briefly is, um, well, e um, equally interesting. So I give you a bit of an excerpt that I got per mail. Um, I try to translate it and then you debug me again. Um, so the idea is um, in, in Jörvik there is a um, friseur, a uh, hair cutter uh, business, uh, correct? Kleppe AS. Yeah, nay. Okay, cool. They exist since 1952 and they have um, eight, um, you know, hair permanent hair cutters, I guess, and uh, one of which is a uh, apprentice, right? So they're learning basically. And part of the regulation is um, for, for, for uh, apprentices to document the process, right? <laughs> Usually I think they're employed for three years to become a proper, you know, whatever discipline you're actually doing it. And as part of this, you need to document your apprenticeship. Uh, for example, by writing reports, reflection, uh, what you did, perhaps designs, uh, pictures of, um, uh, you know, in this case, probably haircuts and things like that. Uh, sort of this documentation uh, regarding uh, the learning plan, meaning they also visit school or see school or something like this. I need to document the plans there as well. They have weekly plans and monthly plans about what we are going to do and so on. So all different kind of artifacts, uh, uh, both text and other form of media, need to be maintained and keep kept accessible over long term. The idea is that at the end of the three years, you can look back and see the archive what did the person actually do, right? Both from a compliance perspective, probably, as well as practically from, uh, you know, for, for the student itself, for the uh, apprentice, uh, her or himself, to actually see what they did and, you know, do their final report and so on. So the idea is that to build an app for that one. So you're actually in touch with the local business as well, external stakeholder, uh, well, I think reasonably well-defined objectives there. Should be feasible, the only challenge is there, okay, you need to do deal with the diversity of data, right? So different types of data that you need to store and make um, accessible again. So that's the message here. Did I get anything wrong? That was the essence, I think, right? Um, else. So that's the original uh, uh, there. I translated it in some uh, brief sense into our, no, I don't see any objections. So I take that as a, yeah, that's okay. I put it briefly here, um, here as a, a project uh, Dreve Klepper Eyes. Dreve means uh, business, right? That's not part of the name, right? Uh, um, does uh, that he's like running the company? Right, so uh, owner basically. It should probably not be part of the title. Okay, so Klepper Eyes. Okay, good. I'll change it. So the idea is basically, uh, you know, having this documentation system. If you're keen, contact him, email address there, right? I'll do the same for Carsten, who had just talked. Um, put his uh, presentation there as well, so you can get in touch with him. We have some other external stakeholders who are keen. We'll link them as well as if they are come in and so on. But most importantly, you. So you actually need to come up with ideas and post them as well, right? Because we want to get a reasonable assurance that you guys know what you're going to do after the next deadline, right? So we're kind of worried that because we only have roughly a month left, and you know we want you guys to have a well, a bit more than a month, uh, actually five weeks. So we want you guys to have a chance to deliver something decent, um, presentable, and actually, you know, well-rounded. And you're working two himself, what is it, two to four, right? That's the pattern, right? Uh, so two minimum, four maximum. Um, n we don't want to have any uh, lone wolves, ideally, because the idea is that you learn from each other and do something productive. So the idea is you have a synergy by working together, perhaps pair programming and work on your professionalism as well. Um, three to four. Sorry? Three to four. Okay, to make it harder, three to four. Here's the revision. Um, three to four individuals. Three to four individuals, yeah. Not, yeah. Right, you pick three to four people and then start working on the project, see how it goes. Uh, Previously, it said that you, that you were the ideal number, and now you. Were what was the ideal number? Zero? No. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, I was on impression two, but uh, we are upgrading to three now. So that's good. Okay, um, that's great. I will check it. Come on, ad hocness <laughs> is beauty. I have, a, I have to check the wiki and, and blame us because you can actually check the wiki history as well. So if we changed it, you can blame us. So go for it. Um, yeah, point is, I don't think it would be terribly hard. It's really pointless with this project. It really depends on the scope, right? That's so right. what we just had now was really big, 
right? If you want to do a bit of machine learning combined with UI, combined with infrastructure, yeah, don't do it with two, two people, right? That's not going to happen, right? But if you do something more small scale, then I think it's very admissible to do it with a pair of two as well. It really depends on the scope. That's why we're encouraging you actually to propose something, right? So we had like, uh, um, yeah, please. Uh, what sort of scope is expected of us in this project? Uh, when you mean scope, what do you mean? I mean, to what scale? Like, is there a certain extent of functionality? Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. That are needed? That's right. So, um, we want to basically um, have you cover, uh, you, you of course, use what you learned in this course, but they actually are a little want you to have a component where you're not just reinventing another app with another nice user face, interface, but go beyond what we actually did or taught, either in the labs or in the classes. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean, for example, in labs, we didn't exploit all the functionality that was available. So it seems more you can do with maps, for example, right? So uh, with sensing frameworks and so on. So if you move out there and go a bit, a bit of beyond uh, that one, or use data, different data sources, web services, for example, use Firebase as a backend. So we want you to push the boundaries a bit, not just replicate what you know already, because you, you don't learn much, you are just exploiting. That's what you're going to do later on when, you, when you, you're going somewhere and you have your knowledge with you. But right now, you still should a bit of, uh, have a bit of knowledge development. So yeah, that's the idea. Pitch the problem. And then we can estimate how hard this will be. And then we give you yay or nay, or should we, can we extend a bell or whistle? Yeah? Um, don't hesitate to bring in your pet projects as well. So if you feel like, I always wanted to do that one, let's try it. There may be something there, right? So I heard people thinking about dealing with sound processing, video processing, dealing with uh, graphics. graphics, of course. Uh, um, native programming yeah. is, of course, an option. Marish will talk about tomorrow, I believe. Perhaps, we'll see. Um, or Go, perhaps even on a device, who knows? Peer-to-peer um, -peer systems on. So push the boundaries a bit, because the point is, we are, that's the tip of the iceberg, what you're learning here, right? We're just looking at things, and then even rather roughly as well, right? So in every time you can, every lecture of us, you can go a lot deeper and explore it way more, and we encourage you to do that. So please pitch the project. That's why this uh, lead time, basically, of the week or so, uh, that you actually come to us or you put the idea out there, and we say, yeah, perhaps we can tune it a bit, or perfect to go for it, yeah? So do it early, often and early. So if you had an idea under the shower, remember it, right? So and post it somewhere or here, and then we can still refine this. Yeah. So bear in mind, project idea should pop up here. And since um, um, we, we will not, um, the idea is also that um, different groups can do the same idea, right? So if um, there's a good idea out there and uh, multiple groups want to pick it up, we haven't limited that in the past. And we don't see any reason why. Because usually, even though we have the same idea, different groups do different things. It's very funny, actually, how different their results end up. So it's quite insightful, especially in the final presentation, because you have something to compare to, at least, conceptually. So that's the idea. Yeah. So don't hesitate uh, doing that. Any other questions regarding the projects? So the scope is not, it's not a hard answer there, but you get the gist, I guess. Um, any other questions you have? Please. Any suggestions for how to come up with ideas? Because, for example, uh, if I do not uh, go uh, the, in the direction of uh, uh, trying to uh, help with that project uh, that guy just came with, uh, I'd want to do something with that fantasy universe of mine. But the question yeah. is, what exactly in it should I do? Because I have lots of lore and stuff like that. What should I do? Like, try to make uh, uh, showcase the nine ruins of the world? Or I don't know. I'm what is relevant for your use case? Well, if you don't see the value of doing it, you could visualize stuff. Um, you could uh, uh, use the tool to record data. For example, I understand that your project is about you know playing playing role playing games, right? So you could record the state of the world in a particular after a particular game or something like this, right? So or metrics of any nature. I mean, of course, if there's nothing worthwhile recording or nothing worthwhile representing, then there's well, I mean, little value. Timeline could be one thing considering the. I th we probably should take that a bit offline because that's a very specific uh, case, right? But, but um, I mean, we had in the past, okay, I'll give you some ideas. In the past, we had ideas where um, uh, one group actually came up, okay, we're recording your fridge content and you propose optimal recipe for you, what you have, right? Classical student problem. So, you know, you basically have one broccoli and one bread and then and you the see... The answer is... The answer is no, there's no recipe for that. Bread, so. butter and eggs yeah. in the morning. Then you have some tomato soup, yeah, or that hamburgers or pizza or bread again with the butter and eggs again. That's right, that's right. Or so this is, this is the, the, what I call the 42 app, right? So that's, there's always the one perfect right answer to <laughs> trot 42. 
uh, for everything. That's not the kind of thing we, uh, world we're living in, what to apply. We also wanted to use it for non-geeks, um, because, uh, surprise, surprise, there are some out there. Not sure <laughs> where, but they are somewhere there. I heard. Anyway, um, so, um, but we had this kind of stuff. We had other people that did skydiving. They recorded their skydiving uh, flights. Uh, divers, for example, cool, hot topic. Find a good dive log app and you probably get money for it because there are a lot of them out there and they're all shitty. I mean, not all, but many are really questionable. So um, if you want to put that out there, did you find a good dive no. log app? No. Never, right? No. All bad. But right. I know Linus was working on one. Sorry? <laughs> Linus was working on one. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, uh, should be more moderate. <laughs> but he, he may not be doing Android coding, I guess. Uh, anyway, so if you have any app that is of uh, sensible, right, or traveling or the like, right, or travel log for you. So we had all kind of diverse apps uh, from very creative to, to different. For example, one uh, app we had in the past, which I really liked was um, Git repo. Classically, we're committing code to a Git repository, right? So, um, but uh, if you did a sort of system entwickling, right, the course, um, and most of you did, what did you do there a lot? in a part of, part of system development. Did you write a lot of code? I tried to figure out how Go works. <laughs> OK. OK, mute button for that one. OK. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Well, one, of, one of, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, no. uh, let, let's figure that out. Who wants? <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, our resources are taken. Oh, okay. Uh, no, like we did a lot of project planning and diagrams right. and charting and exactly. And, uh, same same impression. Yeah. Right. So the idea was uh, that, that that was the essence there. A lot of UML diagrams, right? So and once you commit the code, all that is lost, right? You do them on paper and they're somewhere anyway. And or uh, and automating them or digitizing them is a bit challenging. There are some tools out there. Plant UML, by the way, nice. Um, so you can codify basically your diagrams. But why not keep the drawings as well? Right. And the idea was there. Use the smartphone. Take a picture of your drawing. Uh, um, 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 reduce contrast to black and white, so it's really small, and then commit it to the repo as well. So alongside your code, so you retain your documentation or your uh, development mental stages uh, alongside this. Quite ambitious because it requires to interact with Git from a phone perspective, uh, and your repos, of course, and of course do some image processing, right? So because you you don't want to have a four megabyte image there, right? You want to have a fifty-one kilobyte image there because that's roughly what's happening if you make it black and white, right? You're drawing, right? So, but by retaining certain aesthetics and, and, and uh, legibility. So there was a lot of those kind of little projects that were seemingly simple, but when you stack them together, they were actually quite complex in the end. Yeah. So, um, and yes, of course, there's also the automated map for Pac-Man idea uh, that's floating out there. So, um, so if you want to, for example, draw maps for games and then uh, instantiate them in-game, that would be also a pathway. But anyway, that's a bit pushing it. I think it's more graphics than uh, mobile, really. Yeah, okay, but please uh, start your ideation process. Most of you had experience design. You know how ideation works. Throwing ideas out there, talk to people, bounce back, co coerce on ideas and see if you get a concept around it and bring them up somehow. Either Discord here, issue tracker, mm -hmm. and then we can uh, uh, frame something around it, right? So um, any other idea you had in mind from last year that was uh, noteworthy? Um, that, that one was pretty good. That was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I mean, that's the uh, spot on app, actually, right? Because we never do those things. We always throw away all the stuff we draw on paper. Yeah. Um, so, so we had quite a, quite a worthwhile. Of course, the more obvious ones, like looking up IMDb, that's, that's OK. But that wouldn't be a two-person project, usually. Right? So if you do something extensive on it, doing machine learning or um, uh, things, then, then you can scale it up. But if you're just uh, uh, querying a website and do a basically obscure web app anyway, that's not enough. Yeah. That's kind of one person project. That would be, a, yeah, but we don't do that anymore. So uh, we gave up on that idea because you don't learn much there because you waste so much time on infrastructure uh, just to get going that you don't really productive. Cool. Questions? Norwegian silence. Everyone is content. Uh, is, is it this silent uh, when huh? in other places in Norway when? Uh, you I don't know. I haven't done that. But uh, that's, that's, the, that's the narrative. If you are coming from an Anglo Saxon environment, you expect uh, action all the time. If someone is silent, means they're all sad, right? So, ah, so. Yeah, yeah, that is I remember Simon. <laughs> In Norway, that is like 
Yeah, generally speaking, you do not speak to strangers all that much. <laughs> like if you're on the bus, you're not supposed to speak to Yeah, that's right. The but even in the classroom, to... there's not too much, you know, uh, unnecessary talk. But in other areas, it's more like, quiet, please, right? That's that usual narrative. So we don't have that here. So we need to take it the other way around. So I'm still learning, right? So if you feel the other way around, being if you actually feel sad, uh, let me know. So then we need to work on that. But uh, <laughs> that shouldn't be, uh, yeah? No. Oh, that shouldn't be the lesson learned. Uh, it's, of course, a highly stereotyped uh, uh, impression that I'm, I'm um, giving here. Okay, so a few other things. So you guys were victims um, of our submission system, right? So yes. you guys know, right? Yes, somebody's Very smiling. Fun. That was fun, wasn't three it? Three times. That's right. So and we'll repeat that process. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Um, so um, bachelor group uh, developing submission system. We want to refine that. You are supposed to do reviews on each other. Problem is uh, how to coordinate this. What happens if, for example, a person drops out? What happens if the reviews are not getting done? Well, we want to have a system to automate it. Worst of all, last year we asked people to pick their peers. So you were in the role to pick two people to review your stuff, which is tedious. And it's really hard because it required a lot of force throwing rocks at each other and stuff. No, so not that, but uh, it, was, it was a bit forceful. So now we thought we automate this whole process with a submission system. So you actually don't know who you whom you are reviewing technically. Well, you kind of do because of course it may be in the code, but ideally it's kind of semi-automated. Um, and that's why um, the students started to build that system and this system supposed to is ha supposed to handle all of that. Now, um, the system was up, but we had a bit of a testing issue because we had never tested with that scale, uh, of course, under this kind of load of submissions. And it's really hard to generate test cases of that scale. So you guys were perfect, originally beta testers, turned out to be alpha testers. Um, so, and you know, submitted to your system, to the system. Um, and some, some of the submissions were sim simply um, uh, um, yeah, lost in the process, I guess, which is solved now. So uh, we kindly have asked you to resubmit your labs. I've extended the deadline in the system then to, the, uh, to today, in fact, so I have a chance to talk to you and uh, have a chance for you to actually um, do your submissions still, right? Yeah, and let me uh, expand it from, uh, uh, originally it was going to be the 24th. I'm glad it was 26th because uh, while I did deliver it on the correct day, and then it was deleted at least once. Yeah. So uh, to yesterday <laughs> I had to Really? It. But then I think can we deliver today too? Can we just get so us through a break here, Marsh? Can you just go on? <laughs> <laughs> so things have not been as smooth as they should have been. <laughs> so that's the PC version. Um, so uh, that's right. So, but the point is that's why the deadline is extended. <laughs> Emphasis extended. So um, by tonight, please ensure that your stuff is in there. I will not show up the submissions right now because that, that is private data, so I can't do it. But it basically would show me all the submissions of you that are uh, uh, in there and have submitted properly. If you just check if your link is in there and, and post it again, right? So from tomorrow onward, most likely when you log in as a student, you will see uh, in your lab that there should be something like peer review popping up. And that will basically point you to two other repositories of, that have been submitted that you're supposed to review uh, using a given form. Yeah, I'm still, um, we are still awaiting the result of the tests of that one before I uh, officially open it, part of the reason why we extended the deadline again, to be safe because that is the kind of data you don't want to lose. The submission data was not a big deal because it's like two, you know, it's copying a link and that's pretty much it on your part, so no big deal. But if you're doing actually review, you don't want to lose that. So, um, so um, depending on that process, um, I'll release that soon. Point is, while I'm extending technically the deadlines for submission, I'm not extending the deadlines for the assignments, right? Um, because the deadlines of the assignment are um, defined by your git commit date. Simple as that. You're submitting links to us, right? We know your repo, so you wrap it up uh, on the prescribed deadline, but we'll actually do the submission possibly slightly later. And um, for the third um, assignment, it will even uh, 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 quite a bit later. And the reason is that you will have roughly, that's the plan, until the um, 8th to review the other assignments, right? So peer review should be done by then. And only then, afterwards, we'll open the submission for the third lab, even though it is due on the 8th as well or something like that, right? So we'll submit it slightly later. The reason is, if things bubble up in the system, we want to have a chance to fix it before exposing it to the third lab. It have not re-deleted the stuff this time. Good. Thank you. 
So um, yeah, take that as representative. It, it shouldn't have. So there may be a late um, you know, opening of a submission system, but it shouldn't matter. It's one link away for you, right? So, um, so please expect that there's slight sequential of operation there as well, because we want to ensure that we can complete one full cycle of submission and review before doing the next submission, like system development. So we're a bit late, sorry for that. Um, Lesson learned. But point is, it, will be, it should be very convenient for you from a review point of view compared to last year. If anyone has set the course last year, you know the pain. Please. Some of us also made the mistake of uh, making it originally in Bitbucket, so I had to move it over to GitHub uh, just to be able to actually share it. Ah, because right. Because it's automatically private on uh, Bitbucket. But you can make it public as well, though. Yeah. yeah it, then comes the second problem of it being in the pro in the folder of all of the Android projects, not only its own. So, uh, like all of my labs are in the same folder. Well, that's yeah, so that's that's organizational <laughs> aspect itself. Yeah. yeah. So of course the labs need to be somewhat accessible, right? If there's an issue with accessing a lab, then that needs to be sorted out. Um, good question. Don't know. We need to do it. We take it as it comes, right? And an ad hoc fashion when you when you notify us. So that's the that's the plan right now. Please follow um, the the issues regarding this and wait for the uh, submission. So this one should time out. And tomorrow should be peer review. I'll announce it explicitly so you kind of know what to uh, start it when it's ready. But until then, please continue with lab three. Finish that up, and also of course uh, look at um, uh, the projects. is very important. Anything else I want to say regarding submission system? No, I don't think so. Other than that, we're good. So uh, anyone who hasn't submitted yet again after um, 5 past 11 on s Saturday night, Sunday night, that's right, Sunday night, what am I doing with my life, right? Um, so please check again if your submission is there, right? So um, cool. Other than that, we are good uh, on that front. We talked about this. Um, deadlines, yeah, they may informally shift around a bit, but they're fundamentally uh, the same. The submission maybe is later, later. I'll announce that uh, that was that. Cool. All right. So finally, finally do something meaningful. Um, Teacher? Oh, yeah. Yeah? I suspect that I accidentally made two accounts on that thing. So if I did, the, the one where I haven't delivered anything should probably be deleted. Yeah, so uh, let's do the following. Once we are done with the session, just come here and we'll briefly check into the dashboard. Right. I just don't want to expose the data right now. That's mostly the thinking. On the stream. On the stream, yeah. That's right, so that's why, right? So because there's a lot of personal data. Good, um, coming to the second topic, I'll um, briefly stop and start the stream so I have a, a conceptual break, hang on. So let's see, I hope that uh, Fire, um, um, Google recorded that to some extent. Good, okay, right, so the other thing, um, let's do some content. What did we talk about last time, who remembers? Please. Cool, that's right, deployment of apps, yeah. Um, yes, so I briefly gave you an overview of what uh, Google Play looks like, right, on the back end, right, so how you actually deploy stuff, what kind of the pain you need to go through to get your uh, uh, things accepted, standards you want to uh, comply to, some of them are soft, like uh, appearance standards, for example, others are a bit more harsh, for example, compliance with from a legal perspective, um, um, but also the opportunities you have in terms of monitoring who's using the app, right, so I was showing you, for example, stats from, I think, Marge and Simon's app in the past, who is still using it and um, exposed on the stream. Um, so, you know, by countries, by device and so on. So it's quite a nice opportunity and dashboard of doing it. So, um, but with this deployment, another aspect that really fits quite well into it, um, because it has similar fa facilities and uh, links also to capabilities, is um, Firebase. And um, the question is, why do I talk about yet another tool? Well, it mostly relates to actually getting closer to what um, Carsten was talking about, actually getting you know, devices to talk together, right? So what's the main, main challenge if we have different devices? Of course, the communication, what else? Other operating systems? Yeah, exactly, yeah, what else? Yeah, same thing. Yeah, anything else? Different versions of said operating systems? Yep, good. Anything else? Hardware? Sorry? Hardware? In how far? Hardware. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of uh, hardware the operating system and such is. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, an extension to the operating systems, but think a bit, um, think in terms more in terms of Carsten's app. So what's the, what's the challenge there? 
So of course, the individual device to some extent. Yeah, what else? Actually being able to connect your devices in some way, ah, some information between them. Cool, right. Communication, yep. But beyond this? What does he plan to do with his app? To the cats. Store the information somewhere? Yeah. How many users does it have? That's also important. How many users does that app have? Uh, indefinite? Kind of, right? Yeah. At least five million, uh, millions, right? So for Norway. Possibly. Yeah, no, no, but, but hypothetically. You're right. You don't know, right? So it could be five, could be 50, could be, you know, um, 100 million. I don't know. Perhaps the next communication safety Facebook thing, who knows, right? So um, that's right. So scalability. That's the term for that, right? So how do you scale an app up, right? You build an app, they communicate amongst two devices, five devices, 10, works fine, right? 100, 1 million. So that's a bit of a jump there, right? Oh, if, if you coded that application, he said it previously in the wrong way, and it tries to communicate with like 10,000 devices at a time, oh my. Right, exactly, oh my, exactly. So, but is that impossible? I mean, can't you like go to a server and then route it to all the other devices? Yeah. You probably want to uh, limit which uh, actual uh, which uh, device it actually tries to communicate with in the first place. Yeah. Ex yeah. Okay. Of course, selecting the users. But here, even the server idea. What's the problem there? Uh, I guess you know. Talking hundred million. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Is, is, is Facebook running one server? Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> no, probably not. Right. So probably more than one server and all that kind of stuff. So there's a quite a lot of challenges that you're dealing with, and if you extend that. Uh, it's kind of a bit of a kind of worms, right? So, um, and looking at some of the characteristics or some of the challenges, you know, they're endless, right? So we have authentication. Not only have different devices, of course, the major thing, you need to authenticate across them, right? So one, one of the concerns uh, mentioned there was, well, okay, what happens if criminals get into that system? You know, if you have a totally open system, wow, or you rule the right people into the wrong, no, the right people into the wrong place, right? Effectively or ineffectively. Um, so uh, you, of course, want to deal with data. There was the idea of data storage important. Um, but also you want to, you know, for example, communicate notifications. How do you roll out, okay, please communicate all users in that particular area, right? And say, uh, please don't go here because there's a fire or whatever, right? So that kind of stuff. And you, of course, want to monitor the entire system in a wider sense. Uh, technical challenges, for example, include, of course, synchronization. How do you ensure that, you know, the apps actually share, have a shared state, for example, if you want to develop a kind of game, right? So then synchronization becomes incredibly important, especially for mobile games. Um, and the point is that kind of yeah, is also a challenge because you're always, I'm not sure if you have, no, you haven't done too much networking yet, but the ones that have, um, there's always this mix between front end expertise and back end expertise, right? Dealing with networking, dealing with services, the yeah, asynchronicity challenges, and on the other hand, this, uh, this particularities of user interface design that, that you're dealing with, right? So. Okay, is there a solution to that problem? Surprise, surprise, of course there is a solution to that problem. Otherwise, I would give them that, don't, not give that talk yet, right? So, because we have only five minutes, that's why I'm taking the answers away, sorry. Um, Firebase, the answer, right? Did we hear about this before, Firebase? Uh, it, run, it rings a bell. Good. I can't remember. Much. Put your finger on it. So, yeah? We talked about it in testing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so that Google run tests on different processes. That's correct. There's the Firebase test lab. And you basically submit your app to that thing, and it basically runs it on all kinds of different devices. In fact, physical devices, right? So I think you do a mix of emulator and physical, right? Right. So you can configure it. You pay for it, of course. And you see where your app runs, where it doesn't, get screenshots, uh, CPU usage, all kind of performance metrics, and you know possible feedback you can have. Cool, yeah. Did anyone else come across the Firebase in a different context, or in general, beyond the testing? Or heard about it, perhaps? Ah, right, yes. Specific feature in mind? No, okay. Yeah, good. So Firebase is the thing, right? So, um, so the idea is here basically, okay, we can deal with different devices, connect them, of course, and use a unified interface, but it satisfies pretty much all the features that are just listed there, right? So we have authentication, of course. We can connect uh, different uh, operating systems easily because the SDKs for, uh, uh, for, for iPhone and Swift and uh, um, Objective-C, of course, and then Android, both including Kotlin, of course, and, 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 and Java. Um, based, so you kind of get rid of that problem, that's bifurcation, so you can actually have an application, at least a, an API developed, that is in principle open to any device. Right? Also a challenge that this trick application uh, actually might, might actually have. 
uh, supposedly efficient, right? So because the idea is that um, if you use an SDK, your code against it uh, is that the trans transmission of data is uh, optimized. Um, <coughs> the idea is it's scalable by the design because it's basically stuff is hosted in Google data centers and they're distributed all around the planet. So it's kind of relatively straightforward. Uh, to deal with this. So, but fundamentally, it's a classical pass system, right? So, but a very rich one, right? Pass again, what was that? Cloud people? Oh, platform as a service. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. So you said pass, and I was like, what if you said P R S? I would probably have the access to it. Right, <laughs> anyway, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> So, okay, so key aspects where you have a lot of uh, different features here. So platform as a service. So basically the idea is that you're buying into an existing deployed platform, right? You're coding against it. It's not you running the platform. It's not you defining the platform. You kind of need to buy into someone else's interfaces. But of course, you get the benefits of not needing to deal with all the nastiness that underlies it, right? So for example, global hosting, you can decide where things are actually hosted and actually run. Uh, but you can you exploit, you know, database storage, authentication, uh, function, um, so serverless computing, so you can have kind of uh, um, um, function virtualization uh, in that environment. So basically just encode the bare minimum of what you actually need in terms of calculation as opposed to a massive app. So you can just outsource specific functionality, for example, your proprietary insurance scoring metric or whatever else um, without providing the entire app, simple machine learning and so on, right? So. Um, <clears throat> Just to give you a feel, well, of course, won't get too far in that one, but I just uh, expose you to what you're going to see. You just need your normal Google account uh, in order to sign up for Firebase, because as usual in life, the base version is free, right? And they're very generous when it comes to uh, pricing. So you, you come into Firebase, and that's how it roughly looks like, and you have different projects that you can explore. I'll just open up a, a project here, for example. Let's see, um, let's see if there actually want to sh briefly show the pricing of, because uh, that's quite interesting, the scaping uh, pricing of uh, Firebase, of course. <coughs> there you go. So that's a very generous plan. So you can, for example, if you have an application that has up to 100 uh, connection stores, uh, one gigabyte of data only, and you know, this with 10 gigabytes per month, so quite a bit of juice, you don't pay for it, right? So you can actually use it for free. Um, so you can also try the testing and so on. So it's a very, fairly generous uh, model for you actually to exploit functionality. And that includes all the features that I mentioned, right? Storage, uh, data, ML, uh, authentication, and so on. So it's really, again, a good opportunity for you to get started on something and try it out. And the point is it scales with you. The only thing you need to do is basically sign up for, for a plan as soon as your application scales, scalability out of the box. Right? Okay, what do you have? Well, the general idea is that you create a project in the first place, right? Um, just to get a feel, so you of course give it a name and all that kind of jazz. Um, you have some sort of public facing name, so it's uniquely identifiable, but the most important bit, ah, I'm so lucky. I thought I had my uh, SH1 fingerprint in here, so that would mean I need to <laughs> clean my installation on Android Studio. Luckily I don't. So basically when you create a uh, new, new app, um, uh, it does most of the challenging bits for you. So um, you're cr creating basically a new project. I'll probably just exercise through it uh, um, in intuition briefly. You give a name, right? So demo project. Well, that's not gonna work today. And you sign out of all the kind of data collection stuff and and then you decide where you want to run it. So in this case, US. So that's where the scalability comes in. Be a bit close to your customer. Well, opt in or out of all the data collection stuff. Some benefits involved, of course, but I think, you know, privacy aware, um, you, you can run it the way you want. And what it basically does, it sets up a new project for you entirely. Um, so once it's done, you, of course, can access it and then you get this one, like a project overview. The first thing you want to do is go into your project settings. Okay, that's your project. And your project consists of multiple apps. And here's the linking. So you have this interface, this infrastructure. How do you link to it? You have, for example, iOS support, uh, uh, web service support, uh, native and Android support. And you would just uh, select, for example, the Android support. Um, uh, 
put on his thing. Eh? Okay. Alright. Right. Not today. Anywho, um, for whatever reason, it doesn't really do what I want. Um, and you're basically forced then to. Uh, I was my demo project. Sorry, I need to go back to my. I've been actually working demo, so I'll uh, can show you how it would, should look like. Principle. So you add an app basically, and when you do that, um, you give it a unique identifier, and here is a package name. That's important because it needs to correspond to the package name for your app on your local device when you develop. Remember in the Android manifest, you have an app identifier. Sorry, in the build cradle file, you have an app identifier, and that needs to correspond with that package name. So it's important because that's the way of linking both up. Um, what you then do, you download this Google services JSON thing. That is the co entire configuration of your specific project. So if you use then Firebase on your client side, it knows how to communicate with uh, the server, right? So with your particular project. That's the stuff you need to set up on the server side. The other aspects is a uh, setting up the hash key. I'll show you that later in the slide set. But before getting lost in those uh, specifics, there's some, for some, some gotchas. I just want to highlight what you can do, right? So it basically offers you um, a rich set of authentication. You can define your own users that you basically use. But nicely also, you can rely on third-party providers extensively uh, for signing up, right? So if you want to, for example, uh, um, uh, let you sign up by email password, it's possible, via phone, using the uh, Play services itself, um, uh, using, for example, GitHub, um, and so on. So you can open up to third-party um, you know, uh, authentication uh, quite easily. And the nicest part is, I guess, the anonymous authentication, right? Yeah. Marish highlights that usually. Why yeah. is that so cool? Well, normally when you have an app and you force user to use one of those credentials, it's a little bit of a um, kind of a problem. Like if the user doesn't know if they will like your app, why are you asking them to log in through Facebook or something, right? So you can initiate the functionality using anonymous login. So they don't have to log in with anything. They can test your app. And then if they like it, you can link this anonymous login with the one of the logins later on. So you can have one of the social logins available, but have all the functionality already working without the user to need to authenticate. Uh, it uses like cookies and some session IDs to keep track of the user being the same user on the same device. So whether you're using Android app or whether you're using browser, they will try to always remember that you are the same person. Uh, but it doesn't force the user to, you know, authenticate through the existing account, account. And then it's very easy to link it with the social account later on in the life cycle of the app. Yeah. Cool. So for you, it's a brilliant opportunity because if you want to just do a simple messaging or communication between apps, you can just use that with the anonymous login, right? Yeah. So the, the, the end devices are identifiable, but it doesn't even need to matter for your application. You exactly. just use it as infrastructure, That's totally right. transparent, right? So bear that in mind for your projects. Uh, lastly, a lot of people use that fu functionality. So, um, so that's one of the service set. So you don't need to deal with all that fuss, right? You don't need to know about the Google API, the Facebook API, Twitter, and GitHub, and all that stuff, because it changes every two minutes anyway. So, but you just need to um, update basically your configuration here uh, to allow that, right? Yeah, well, one quick yep. note about this uh, anonymous one. So yep. if you have the anonymous one, why would you just have no authentication at all? Uh, well, the reason is that you are liable for the API that you're exposing. So if you have no authentication whatsoever, it's very easy to write a script which basically denies of service attack on whatever you're doing. Uh, whereas if you have any form of authentication or even the anonymous one, it's much harder to do this type of abuse. Um, so you are encouraged not to ever publicly publicize any of the app with the API which has no protection whatsoever. Uh, you should kind of by the user agreement have some protection and the anonymous one is the easiest one yeah cool yeah cool uh, in fact you, in case you do it you're easily identifiable basically right yeah. so, so somehow identifiable anyway cool so yeah so it's one of the features of course you can you know do your own user management as well so it's built in as well so you can still fall back to that one think about it that you know massive uh and um, middleware for enabling all kinds of services that would otherwise be manually encoded the other feature that they have is, uh, of course, the database. Uh, the, the main thing, the main idea is there that is uh, 
Yeah, basically a classical NoSQL setup, right? So you have connections and, um, um, and of, of, of arbitrarily structured uh, items that you basically store there and manage there, right? So you can make up your own uh, database. Let's see if I can. Yeah, so basically it would ask you for collection. You get a pass to the collection ID based on your Firebase instance, so your project instance. You can access the collection then and then add documents to that one as well, right? So that kind of uh, stuff. So you can actually quite flexibly use that as a database. You have storage, that's for like binary files, stuff like that. So similar to S3 in Google, in Amazon, sorry, where you basically, you know, host pictures or any stuff like that. Again, you're one gig free, so you can use it. You can have your mini cloud service there if you like. Careful, I think they probably explicitly exclude that from the terms and conditions, I don't know. <laughs> but, but in principle, you can store uh, blobs there, right? So stuff, if you want to deliver images or static contents, assets and the like, good location. Also easy, think about if you do, um, you know, preloading of the game, you basically just keep all the assets here and load them in, in, in uh, you know, prior to starting game only. So it's easy, up, it's easy to update uh, using that mechanism uh, as well. And then, yeah, basically, um, by the way, this basically relies on the Google Cloud Service in the back end. So pretty much all of that, right? So you fundamentally, if you have that with Google Cloud Service, that, well, it's a different attack point here. You find that there's a lot of reference to it, like GS, for example, AppSpot, which is the URLs usually used. So you can just, uh, upload stuff and of course constrain the usage as well uh, by by um, user and applications. Um, right, so hosting, uh, deploying mobile web apps and so on, I think that's a bit going beyond. Um, so function um, um, serverless computing, which is kind of in the making it seems because I was playing around with this. First thing, it asks you to install Node.js um, on your client. So yeah, we're probably not going as deep, but what's they, quite, sorry. We haven't had it last year, so it's a new thing. That's yeah. Yeah. They're probably still in the making. But what is cool, though, you can actually rely, rely on Google APIs for a large range of different purposes. So if you want to, for example, in your, and it comes back to your projects, if you want to do some sort of recognition, for example, text recognition or, you know, barcode scanning, of course, the more obvious one, image labeling, because Google is big on that one, right? Characterizing, uh, attaching semantic labels to images. Uh, or auto replies, and of course, language translation and so on, or identification, rather you can use their ML um, toolkits as well. So that's not like, not like an Amazon where you have a rich um, machine learning platform that's very specific application cases that you can embed um, with you know, rather limited um, um, implementation on, on your device. So relatively straightforward. So it, for example, the imaging uh, labeling would, would work like this, that you, uh, you know, have a certain uh, categories and associated labels and would tell you what you see on a particular image, right? You can easily identify what that image does. If it's relevant to you in an app, you're taking a picture, you want to know what's going on in that picture, for example, that's one pathway of doing it quite cheaply, right? So you rely on Firebase to identify it. Uh, and of course, since that is usually can be quite expensive, again, the scalability is not your problem, it's Google's problem. Right? So this would be kind of the productivity functionality that you kind of have in terms of uh, as a developer that you could do. But beyond this, of course, here's the famous test lab that uh, Carl talked about. So basically, um, that's directly linked to the Firebase test lab where you, um, you know, deploy your APK and basically have it tested for you an arbitrary number of devices and with, you know, different complexity and so on. You can define your test cases comprehensively there. Do they have a free tier? Or? Yeah, it's a free tier uh, part of it. Uh, here you have five, what is it, five tests per day and for virtual devices, 10 tests per day. That's not bad. It's quite cool, yeah, actually. Yeah, that's pretty good. Right? So, um, yeah. in fact, it's the same as on the lowest paid tier. And on the highest tier, just pay per use. So, mm -hmm. that's cool. So, uh, yeah, probably worth while even uh, trying out, actually. So, anyway, so just to highlight, um, of course, you know, performance metrics that they record, uh, b because that's quite straightforward, they, depending on your load. So, it's good for you because you can quickly see if you need to scale up, right? If your app is underused, so that's your, your go to uh, area for actually figuring out what's going on. The entire thing, of course, comes with a, um, a dashboard for overviews, events, um, and the coolest bit, which we'll probably not get to talk to about, is um, or one of the cooler bits. So you find the active users, for example. You can structure your audiences. Uh, is messaging, right? So I think that's a quite, quite good feature because that goes into uh, that goes into along the lines what um, this project was asking for. Okay, how can I use this as an infrastructure to quickly send messages amongst my users? Right, to my users. And um, for whatever reason, it's not really loading here. Please load. Not sure what's wrong here today. Yesterday it worked quite neatly. Basically, it offers you um, 
to, to send messages um, to no avail. And from a client side, well, that's the. It's a bit risky. <laughs> you know. Yeah, perhaps that was. Yeah, there's something there. That yes. was bold. Yes, they did it. Cool. So that's the idea, right? You basically can send uh, send notification, right? So you send a notification with a given title. Uh, of course, you can access this via API, all that stuff, right? So saying, okay, here's the fire hazard or here's the uh, risk or crime zone or whatever else. You send a message. You can identify targets and that, that how that works in the back end. Uh, I need to type something. That's meaningful. So so I have some text and some notification title. And then you can nicely, and that was one of the concerns, target users, specific either by apps. For example, if you have multiple apps attached to um, that one, you saw that it's one project with n apps, basically. Here is only one installed, so it's fairly boring. Or you can have subscription topics, right? So if you have different users subscribed to different topics, weather, news, tourism, travel, whatever, you can send them targeted messages. Of course, you can use that for, you know, for, for, for commercial po um, uh, uh, objectives, but also for that kind of application that we saw, right? You just want to have all people in Oslo, for example. They subscribe to, uh, you know, uh, crime in Oslo or whatever else, and then you would just send those guys uh, a particular message, right, and schedule it now. Do a lot of additional conversion to, to adopt to, for example, um, um, yeah, uh, local characteristics and stuff like this. You can do a bit of meta, um, meta configuration in terms of retention and priority of the message and then send it basically out. And if you have a client that's supposed to supposedly subscribed to it, I just give you a very simple example that's actually stolen from Google I.O. 2016. Uh, because it was quite descriptive and even better, it actually worked on emulator. Um, it basically um, uh, is relatively straightforward. So what you do in your um, application is, so here's the application ID that links to your app in the uh, Firebase um, uh, console that I showed before briefly. But the more important things that you need to basically have is just implement some of the Firebase functionality, right? So it depends on which model you're using. You usually have Firebase Core plus X, like EML one for data or databases or messaging for messaging. Uh, which then automatically retrieved by Gradle. Of course, that needs to work. It needs to have, and that's one of the main things if you're running it on your local form or emulator, the Google Play service is installed. If not, it may or may not give you a message. So that's pretty ugly to debug, so install your Google Play services. In short, check that Google Play works on your virtual device. And yet you signed on as well, signed in as well. Um, and then you should have access to uh, Firebase functionality. And you see it sits all here. Um, in, in com Google Firebase and so on. And how you access it is basically by a singleton um, um, here, right? So, so here, for example, Firebase Messaging, that's the messaging service. You say get an instance, which is a singleton, and then subscribe to a given topic, for example, news, right? And you can also, of course, do an unsubscribe here. And um, when you then suddenly get some news in the Android manifest, you basically configure to what intents you're listening to. So in one intent that um, is sent from Firebase is the message event, right? Comes com Google Firebase message event. And you say, okay, which service or which application component is invoked upon receipt of that um, intent? In this case, my Firebase messaging service. So let's look into this thing. Um, and then what do you do? Well, on message received, that's where the uh, um, 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 service is received. It sends a notification, which basically means it takes apart um, um, the information it actually gets and um, it gets a notification passed along. And this notification can be, for example, shown as part of a notification on the Android status bar on top or something like this, right? So you can easily use that, the payload for whatever you want. Put it in your local database, show it on a display, talk, have the user interact with this. So it's a best, basically a publish uh, subscribe pattern, very classical one. And just for the sake of it, let's see if that works um, for demo effect. Um, but the point is the API is, of course, not uniform. The, um, it really depends on what functionality you, you plan to use. If you use the anonymous login, uh, it's quite a bit different. I will um, have in my slide set linked a set of demos or example samples you can actually use. Um, but here, just to demo it. So basically, you have this app here. You will subscribe to news. Well, it's now hope hopefully subscribed. Let's see if that goes. And then we have this uh, um, demo thing here. And this is also where um, demo message. 
some content. This is also where the label come from. You probably saw on the target that you have subscribed topics, one of them being news. In fact, the only one being news. That's precisely because someone subscribed to it. And then when you schedule it now, you should actually um, see ideally on your target device. Um, let's see, that works now. No promises. Ah, it actually does, right? So it actually shows up here now as a notification, demo message, some content, and so on, right? And it's, the integration is really very simple. You just call Maya Firebase Messaging, get the instance, subscribe to something, deal with the incoming intent, please. Uh, does the, the messaging, does it need to be an actual person that sits down to write the message? It can be automated or something? Can be automated. Yeah, there's API. You can do anything can you want. Automated. Either way. So you can completely do it in the background if you want, right? So you could say, for example, from an individual device, a signal to Firebase using the API, and from the Firebase API, do a uh, broadcast to all connected devices with a given topic. That's why I public subscribe. So it's really, really nice. If you post to that channel, it's distributed. So the idea, if you get that, uh, hopefully from that brief demo here, is that uh, all that infrastructure stuff, right, communication patterns, authentication, storage, coordination in the widest sense is done for you by Firebase, right? But what's the price? Well, you buy into someone else's infrastructure, right? You need to code against the API, you depend on it. If your application inherently is based on Firebase, surprise, surprise, it's very tightly coupled to it, right? So, but on the other hand, this is actually, a, it's, it's, it's a unique opportunity. You will not be able to create that kind of complexity in terms of application on your own in your project. And uh, Google is admittedly quite generous in terms of uh, its functionality and also um, the plan. Okay, um, that was a bit brief. I uh, admittedly uh, was, was, was pushing that a bit. I have a slide set which I put up that, that shows you, runs you through basic processes, what you need to do, some gotchas. Most importantly, it points you to Firebase documentation, of course. But also have a look at the demo projects they actually by Google for Firebase. And they show you all different kind of things you can do, like authentication, messaging, in-app messaging, using a database, whatever. Basically, all the kind of examples you've just shown, seen, you can try and play with this, get a feel in what it does. But point is, right now, bear in mind as an opportunity for your project, because suddenly, the project we just heard probably sounds a lot simpler if you know that this infrastructure exists. Who agrees? Yeah. Right. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, just one quick thing. Uh, some of the things he, uh, you, you can do through the Firebase website, but Android Studio has uh, integration with Firebase. So yeah. you can do a lot of the management through Android Studio directly uh, as well. Yeah. Good point. You haven't used that, right? You <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can link your project, you can set what you want to do, and so on. And, and it works quite, quite well. So you can so you can, you can extend it tomorrow. Maybe run through the ID. No, no, not go deep. Just, just yeah. highlight that again. Yeah. Yeah.